Just a quick announcement before we start. Those who follow our social media will have already seen this, but What's Your Name is launching a new line of cross-stitch patterns of each of the women featured on the program. They're delightful, if I do say so myself, and you can buy them on our website, our Etsy page, or get them free by becoming a patron at the fanatic level on our Patreon page. Links to all of that are on our website at whatshernamepodcast.com. This episode is sponsored by Girls Can Crate. Girls Can Crate is a unique subscription box inspiring girls to believe that they can be and do anything. So how do they do it? Like us, Girls Can Crate believes that real women make the best heroes. And every month they deliver them to your doorstep. Hi, Katie. Hi, Olivia. So I want you to think about a single woman who lives in an apartment in New York... Okay. She has a fabulous wardrobe. She has a great career that she loves. She is independent and really enjoying being a single woman in the big city. So she's Sarah Jessica Parker. Exactly. She's sex in the city. Yeah. This is obviously late 90s, early 2000s. Right, yeah. Actually, we're in 1936. Wow. This woman's name is Marjorie Hillis. And she is the author of one of the biggest bestsellers of the 1930s, Live Alone and Like It. (laughs) Love it. I'm Olivia Mickle. And I'm Katie Nelson. And this is What's Her Name? Fascinating women you've never heard of. Marjorie Hillis lives in New York. She is an editor for Vogue. She's in her 40s. And she writes this book about how singleness doesn't have to be embarrassing. You are not a spinster. You are a live aloner. A live aloner. A live aloner. (laughs) She has created this new catchphrase for women who are actively choosing to enjoy their single life. Cool. So to learn more about Marjorie Hillis, I talked to Joanna Scutz, who is the author of The Extra Woman, which is a fantastic book about Marjorie Hillis and about her writing. My name's Joanna Scutz. I'm a writer and I am a cultural historian. I'm interested in women's stories, women's histories. Marjorie Hillis uh, was a surprise bestseller. When she was um, in her late 40s, she published a book that became a huge hit. Uh, It was called Live Alone and Like It, A Guide for the Extra Woman. And it was a little self-help book that was published in the summer of 1936 in the United States. And it was a book that combined um, a lot of very frivolous sounding and very fun sounding advice for how to be glamorous and independent um, if you were single. But it was also a very practical book that didn't imply that if you were single um, as a woman, that it was something that you were doing temporarily or it was something that was only going to be a part of your life while you were young until you got married. Uh, The book addressed itself to women and singleness as a likely state at some point. She had built this life for herself, um, an independent life, and essentially live alone and like it was her philosophy as a woman who was earning good money um, and had just never had anyone who who she wanted to marry or who wanted to marry her and had gotten to a point in her life where she thought that was not going to happen. And yet, despite thinking about that as an absence or a lack, as most most of the culture around her really did, she turned it on its head and she turned it into a deliberate choice. Instead of being a a spinster or a, an old maid or a single woman she talked about herself as a live alone the idea of living alone as a kind of deliberate practice and she found an enormous readership there's even a picture of franklin roosevelt reading this book on vacation what everyone read this book it was so wildly popular. Wow. It wasn't just seen as, here's a book for single people to fix themselves. This was a cultural phenomenon. Cool. She is embracing this idea that singleness is not unusual. 
Singleness is not embarrassing. Every single woman is going to be single at some point in her life, and there's absolutely no reason why she shouldn't be able to enjoy that. The content of the book is really pragmatic, but masked with all of this witty banter. Hmm. And so you probably get halfway through this book before you start to realize what you're reading. That this isn't just how to be a fabulous single lady. This is a social commentary. This is a way of turning upside down narratives of not just singleness, but what relationships are for, what matters to women. And yet nobody seems to have noticed (laughs) because she does such a good job of masking what's actually happening. What comes to mind is that this is the 1930s version of all the single ladies. Yeah. I was going to sing it. Probably can't afford to sing it. We can't afford Beyonce money. (laughs) Right. But as Beyonce singing single ladies, she kind of rehashing Marjorie Hillis's message. (laughs) Yes. And I think every single generation since her has rediscovered this idea as if it's new. Yeah. Not realizing that we've done it before. Yeah. It's revolutionary now to think about that happening in the 30s. Yeah. In the 30s, this was not a big deal. Mm. This was, it was a, a exciting shift in thinking about singleness, but there it was not seen as threatening. This is right in the height of the self-help book boom. The brand new idea that you could fix yourself is really appealing, especially when the depression means you have almost no options to change anything else. The idea that maybe the change you need is in you right, is really appealing. You can change you, even if you can't change the entire rest of the world that is awful. Oh, cool. It seems like we're having a rebirth of that right now. Yeah. Especially in America. Like, we look at America at large and go, well, that's a huge disaster that can't be fixed. But maybe, (laughs) maybe I can fix me. Be the change. You know, I'm torn. Right. Yeah. I'm very torn between seeing that as an empowering thing. Mm. It is true. When you can't change anything, all you can do is change yourself. But pretending like changing your insides can fix the ridiculous, awful world can sometimes like numb people to no, we just have to change society. But I think it is a really good coping mechanism. Yeah. Interesting. A lot of these books have a very dog eat dog kind of attitude. You can achieve success if you just have to want it better than the guy next to you. You know, a lot of these books are aimed at men, your determination to lead the best life that you can, no matter who you have to tread on to get there. But very few of these books are really aimed at at women, um, certainly not at women as wage earners and as independent workers. So Marjorie Hillis was uh, tapping into an unusual sort of market by explicitly aiming her book at women who were single, who weren't providing for families and weren't expecting to be looked after by a husband. They had only themselves to rely on, but also only themselves to please. And she showed women that that situation could be liberating and not pitiable. This is pretty shocking, I think, for many of us to think about this happening in the 30s. This is not the narrative we have of the 30s. Yeah, our narrative of the 30s is desperate mothers in the dust bowl, breastfeeding, starving strangers on the side of the road. Exactly. We have one story yeah, of the 30s, we, we might say. Yeah. And this definitely doesn't fit it. I think one thing we don't realize is what an opportunity the Great Depression was for women. Oh. Which sounds terrible. But when society breaks down, boxes break. The narrative of you have to be this way yeah. doesn't function so well. And And it's funny because we're coming out of the 20s. Yeah. So this isn't like upturning the entire world. It's pushing back on something that's been creeping back in for a few years. When society starts to break apart, maybe you double down on you're responsible for taking care of your children. Hmm. Society isn't responsible for taking care of your children because that's a handy narrative for the people who are destroying your society. So there is still the Great Depression happening. And the idea of choosing your life is kind of a fantasy 
for many, many Americans, the idea that you can just choose the kind of life that you want is nonsense, but it's delicious nonsense. <laughs> I mean, how fun to just imagine what would I do if I could just do what I wanted? Mm. What are my priorities as a person, not the ones of my people attached to me? Yeah. Her publishing company also makes a genius decision, and I can't help but think that this is definitely partially her idea. Being an editor for Vogue, she very much understands the power of lifestyle marketing. The publisher makes the, at that point, very strange decision to start pushing the book through department stores. That means that you can sell the book alongside products that the book suggests that a single woman should oh. have. <laughs> For example, <laughs> just because you live alone doesn't mean you dress like a slob when you're home. Uh -huh. <laughs> the single woman, every single woman should have at least four negligees. <laughs> you must have a variety of bed jackets. Yes, of course. You should, of course, always set a nice table. Indeed. With flowers and china. Cook yourself an excellent meal. Dining alone is not sad. Dining alone is an indulgence. Huh. You can have your favorite dishes on the table. You can do what you want. And so all of these products become attached to the marketing of this book. You have, and we have a, some great photos that we'll put on the website from Joanna Scott's of the book in a display with a mannequin in the perfect negligee and the perfect place setting. All of these things become wrapped into this. So it's kind of like a curated lifestyle you can just opt into wholesale. You buy all the things, you have the book, and then you live the fabulous single life. Well, and that's what I find is really interesting because it could become that very easily. It She easily could have slid it into, here's the way you should dress, here's the way your apartment should be decorated. And she is very, very clear that that is not what this is about. This is not a lifestyle that you buy, mm. even though they're marketing right, it. Right, even though you buy it at the department store. Maybe you buy it at the department store, but what you buy is 100% up to you. Okay. This is your life. The entire point of being single is that you don't have to cater to anyone. So if you want to spend all your money on theater tickets and not dinner, fine, hmm. do that. If you want to spend all your money on travel, do that. If you want to spend all your money on the best apartment you have ever seen in your life and fabulous furnishings and great parties, do that. It's your money. You get to choose. I mean, she definitely does have these rules. She is Vogue, right? Right. You should dress the way you like, as long as it's fashionable. But don't follow <laughs> trends. No, yeah. Every every object in your home should be something you love, not just something that Vogue told you to buy. The, the big object that she's, she's always talking about is the bed jacket. I think Marjorie says you should probably aim to have at least four, mm -hmm. um, but the number is, seems clearly and it's an open-ended <laughs> <laughs> wardrobe item. I, she's absolutely convinced, I think she says, it's even more reason why you should try to look your best when you live alone, even more so than when you're, you're married. Um, I think she really believed that, that, that there's this very close connection between how you look on the outside and how you feel on the inside, and, and you deserve it. You deserve to, to look your best. You know, she writes a lot about the need to, to keep committed to, the, to that idea of, of being alone and being enough that it's going to be hard at times. You will be lonely. You will find yourself um, wishing that you had some support, but that, but it takes a, a kind of strength and encouragement to, to realize that that's, uh, you know, that you are still enough. Let's pause for just a second to thank our sponsor, Girls Can Crate. Girls Can Crate is a unique subscription box inspiring girls to believe that they can be and do anything. Every crate features an inspiring woman and her own unique story of why she's awesome, a 28-page activity book, plus everything you would need to complete two or three hands-on seam activities and more. And that's one of the reasons why I love Girls Can Crate so much. They really do make it possible for girls to imagine an entirely new way of being. I think a lot of what Marjorie Hillis did for women in the 30s and 40s 
Girls Can Create is doing a similar thing for little girls. They're changing the lens of what it looks like to be a girl and a woman in this world. And I love that. And for our listeners, if you go to girlscancrate.com, girlscancrate.com, and use the code HERNAME, all one word, you can get 20% off your first box on any order. Check them out now at girlscancrate.com. And when you order, make sure you use the coupon code HERNAME, all caps, so that they know we sent you. She is a strong proponent of breakfast in bed, even if you make it yourself. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> how does that work? <laughs> so you prep your tray the night before, you get up, you, you know, maybe make your tea, make your toast, put it on your prep tray, bring it back to bed, put on your nice warm bed jacket. <laughs> and then she says, and if it's Saturday and you want to spend the entire day in bed with breakfast and the paper, do it. It's your day. <laughs> do what you want. I absolutely love this idea of like, I'm going to make myself breakfast in bed. Yeah. <laughs> she reminds me of Donna from Parks and Rec. Oh, Treat yourself. I mean, really, <laughs> Donna is living her best life. Yeah. She buys what she wants. She loves men, but she is not going to commit unless, what does she say? Like, they have to be grade A man for her <laughs> to be willing to commit to a man. <laughs> and that's exactly what Marjorie Hillis is advocating here. She gets cast a lot as advocating against marrying, and she's not. She's very clear that marrying is fine, but it better be better than being single. Relationships are not defaults. She has a chapter in this book called Can You Afford a Husband? <laughs> and just that shift. Cool. Yeah. Cost-benefit ratio. Has, <laughs> yeah. That, that a husband can be an indulgence. Mm. That a husband is a conscious, rational choice. And that same idea that it, he better be grade A. That if you have your own income, if you're doing fine... Maybe you can marry that penniless poet that you really enjoy. And that's your indulgence. <laughs> you acquire a husband that makes you happy yeah. in the same way that you acquire anything else that makes you happy, be that orchids or China or a trip to Europe. Hmm. This kind of idea of can we rethink marriage to be about pleasure and fun and companionship and not about financial support, not about that that your job is going to be to be a wife. If you have a different kind of job, maybe it means you rethink what it means to be a wife, and maybe there's a fun alternative to that. This is sort of the beginning of um, what grows into kind of like the positive psychology movement um, in late the 50s especially, but the idea just seemed to her very common sense. I mean, most of her philosophies are based on what she calls a very sort of common sense observation, her own experience, and things like if you make the effort to sort of look good, you'll feel good. Um, but if you are feeling, I mean, she doesn't use the word depressed, but certainly if you're feeling sort of low or blue, that the solution is sort of movement, it's action, it's activity, it's to kind of get out of your head go do something and be a part of something. It really is a kind of power of positive thinking before that's really been sort of formulated and certainly before it's kind of taken seriously as a psychology. She really believed that part of being happy alone was that you joined things and you had a social life and you were part of a group, part of your community, part of the city, the, the action of the city, you know, that you had to find an identity. She has a wonderful line, which is sort of very much of its time, but she says, be a communist, uh, be a ladies aid worker, be a stamp collector, but whatever it is, be something. Oh, I, I really like that. She doesn't present this as, here's my new worldview that will change everything she's like right duh yeah <laughs> yeah find what you like yeah do that thing the truest things are often so simple right but also is it simple oh just just discover what you like and do it just just get out there and yeah apparently 
But there's this TED talk by this amazing psychologist who specializes in 20-somethings. And she's who I thought of when we were, you were talking about Marjorie Hillis's philosophy because she says the same thing. She says, focus on building identity capital, which is mm. an interesting way to phrase it. But she, this, the woman who did the TED talk, she loves teaching 20-somethings how to focus on who they are and creating themselves and, you know, deciding what they like. But it must be a hard thing. And, you know, the idea that girls have as many options to choose from as boys. And the idea that deciding what you want to be when you grow up is not about deciding how big you want your poofy wedding dress to be, but it's, uh, you know, it's about what do you, what contribution do you want to make in the world? What do you... How do you want to spend your days? Who do you want to be? I mean, how many self-help books have been written since this one that are essentially find what you like and do it, Mm -hmm. right? Like, We've been sharing that message for 100 years in America. Well, we've been sharing the message apparently since, you know, know thyself. Yeah. So so apparently it's tricky. It's a hard thing. And according to Socrates, it's the hardest (laughs) thing you can do. It yeah. is the most difficult task, and that's why most people don't do it, according to Socrates. So maybe in a few more thousand years, somebody will figure out how to find what you like and do it. But maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. that struggle is at the core of what it is to be human. But Marjorie Hill gave it a good crack, <laughs> teaching people <laughs> to even think about it. And I think, yes, we have been talking about this forever. But we haven't been talking about it as much, and especially in American culture, for women. Yeah. That that's an option for women to just go, I'm going to be me. Yeah. When for various periods throughout American history, we have lionized diffusing your own identity as a woman yeah. into the people that you are nurturing, be those adult males or small people. Right. That, and just because um, it's hard, I think, doesn't mean that it's impossible. Right. I mean, I agree with Marjorie Hillis personally. I think it's me too. the best thing that you could do. And it's never too late, even if you're 65 years old and discover <laughs> that you never really took that step. Still do it. That's interesting that you should bring that up. Huh. The way that the book is put together is it's sort of equal parts her kind of advice and, and then these case studies, they're stories of often women who have sort of drifted into a kind of life that they thought that they wanted or were taught to expect and realize at a certain point that it's not for them. And she has absolutely no kind of moral judgment on women who decide, I don't want to be married anymore. I don't, this partnership, this family is not what I want and who walk out or who leave husbands and get divorced start over um, in whatever capacity and it's absolutely fine if it's in the service of a kind of truer a more meaningful life and a truer form of happiness plenty of the women are that are sort of the single women she profiles or she writes about have chosen this after seeing what the alternative was well even beyonce got married right (laughs) well So, actually, so does Marjorie Hill. In 1939, Marjorie announced that she was getting married. So this was a fascinating twist in this live alone story. Uh, She was 49 years old, and in the summer of 1939, she announced that she was going to marry a man who was a widower um, with teenage children who owned a chain of grocery stores um, across New York City. She got an incredible amount of sort of good-natured joking. (laughs) Some of it's more good-natured than others. There was one newspaper that ran her picture under the headline, Didn't Like It, which is a pretty blunt way (laughs) of suggesting that the Live Alone and Like It guru is somehow um, betraying her readers, is, uh, is going back on her word. None of those newspapers actually managed to find any readers who were quoted as saying, you know, now my worldview is turned upside down. It tended to much more be the reporters themselves who were sort of having fun with it. As she keeps pointing out, 
I never said that you shouldn't get married. Right. I said you should choose yeah. whether you want to get married or not. You should do what you want. Right. And if you find someone good enough, then marry him. Mm. And she did. <laughs> did she live happily ever after? Or did she decide to bail later? She was married for 10 years. And then her husband passed away suddenly of a heart attack. And she was facing her 60th birthday. And she was alone again. She did go on to write two more books, both of which really take up this theme of you still deserve happiness and really even more, I think, radically than before because she's saying that you know, widows and divorcees and women in their 60s and 70s and 80s have every right to be happy. You're still a person, even if you are a grandmother. The world might see you as these are sort of incredibly diminished roles that society affords to older women. And she really speaks to that and says, you're still you. Now, when she's writing these books in the post-war period, we are sliding into this new narrative of what women are for. Right. Leave it to Beaver. Right, exactly. And it is, I think this is, this is like my biggest soapbox in my women's studies classes. This false mythology that we have created of the traditional American family, mm -hmm. which is the mother and the father and two or three children living together in one in house. In suburbia. Yeah. In suburbia with a picket fence. Dad goes to work. Mom bakes things and wears heels and cleans the house and raises the children. Mm -hmm. And this is the way that it has always been. And we call it the traditional family. A lot of the early feminist writers in the 60s, um, Betty Friedan in particular, looks back at the 1930s as this moment of possibility for women. And she really traces in magazines and in popular culture a different kind of vision for what women could be and traces the kind of shutting down of those possibilities. You know, it's the difference between Catherine Hepburn and Marilyn Monroe, strong, capable woman literally wearing the pants to this woman who is as kittenish and, and kind of pliable and docile as possible. And that you know, within less than 20 years, this vision of womanhood has just changed so completely. The other thing that really came, came through to me, and I, was, I have to shout out Elaine Tyler May, who's written so many wonderful books about that period. And her, her book, Homeward Bound, is a mm. wonderful explosion of so many of these myths and she and she makes the point that people in the 50s didn't think they were being traditional they thought they were being cutting edge yeah. they thought that they had discovered modern scientific expert evidence it was this weird belated sort of embrace of freud the uh, the way to be happy is to simply fulfill your biological destiny as early and as often as you can there is nothing traditional about this family model at all. This was the scientific way. Yeah. Literally, the science says this is how a family should work. This is the most effective way. Amazing. And that, you know, that's why you get this incredible plummeting of, of marriage ages and you get teenagers marrying. And it wasn't because they were trying to be Victorian. They believed that they were absolutely modern but that they just figured out something new science says that you know that, that spinsters are tragic and miserable and and deviant or women who are overly educated are going to damage their children psychologically and that population that actually kind of lives that way but it's this idea the the idea of sort of the normal family and the terror of the deviation from that norm it's really amazing that we still accept. None of this is American history, but because we have this new medium, because we have television, it is the mm. most effective propaganda job in American history. We believe that that is an accurate representation of not only what was happening yeah. then, but what has always happened. The dad works, the mom stays home, which means childcare and homemaking. Mm-hmm. And that that's normal. This is normal in white, 
middle class, white collar, <laughs> Midwestern America from 1952 <laughs> until 1958. And that's our narrative of America. That's the only time yeah, this exists. That became the story. Nobody seems to have noticed that the, well, actually, I mean, people at the time noticed, but <laughs> and talked about it constantly. They were like, this is nonsense. Yeah. But we sort of remember it as like, oh, yeah, they, yeah, they all, everybody bought it. It is astounding. It's this extraordinary, weird kind of anomaly in history. And then, but we treat it as though it's like an origin story. So after the war and after her husband's death, when Marjorie Hillis starts writing these books, even though the content is very similar to what she had been writing before, the way it's received by society is really different. Not only has the culture shifted, the war is over, the government and industries are trying very hard to convince women to quit their jobs. The entire social trajectory is pushing women to minimize themselves, yeah. to become a role, and trying to convince them, no, remember, that's how it was before. And even though none of your mothers and grandmothers did that, this is what we're doing. And so the exact same message that was wildly popular in the 30s becomes really suspect mm. in the 50s. We really don't want to hear this anymore. We don't want to hear from widows. She really insists on independence. You're still you, and you're still, you know, your happiness is still something that you should be striving for. It's something you should be fighting for. Whatever you do, don't move in with your children. <laughs> hold on to your money, hold on to your financial independence. She encourages women in their 60s to go out and get a job, do whatever you can to maintain your independence as long as your health will allow it. And she's saying, you know, your, your grandchildren should have to make a date with you weeks in advance because your calendar is so full. You'd still deserve your place in the world. I, I still think it's a radical message and one that people find hard to hear. Very big thanks to our guest, Joanna Scutz, and to our sponsors for this episode, Marlene Tressman and Pamela Toller. You can become a sponsor on our Patreon page for as little as a dollar a month, and there are great prizes like women's history trading cards, cross-stitch patterns, and more. Every donation makes a big difference, and every penny helps us create more women's history. Music for this episode was provided by Daniel Henderson and his big band, The New Hot Five, The Vintage Vocal Quartet, and by permission of Carol Bash. You could have a cross stitch of like Marjorie Hillis and Beyonce, single ladies. <laughs> Maybe you should have a cross stitch collection that's all the, all single, the ladies. single ladies. That's amazing. <laughs> if you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review at iTunes or wherever you listen. It's much more important than you think in helping new listeners find us. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, where we post lots of photos each week. Our theme song was composed and performed by Daniel Foster Smith. What's Her Name is produced by Olivia Mickle and Katie Nelson, and this episode was edited by Olivia Mickle.